I've been waiting while I've enjoyed immensely our work through the Old Testament to get to the Psalms. Because when you're in the Psalms, you're actually preaching and reading through what would have been the Hebrews hymn book. I know we're used to rhythm and rhymes that work and are singing differently than theirs did. But can you just imagine? Um, there was choirs, there were groups of people, there were massive amounts of instruments that sometimes would articulate the praise of the Lord in this way. When we look at creation, we get a chance to understand some things about the Lord. But as I kept reading Psalm 8, two things occurred to me. One is, it's about the glory of the Lord. Make no mistake about it. It's about God receiving glory. But in another sense, almost in a, almost in a secretive, subtle sense, it's also about the value of man. Now, just let me talk about that before we get started. We've grown up in a culture that didn't really believe in God, and so the only way they could esteem man as being valuable was to simply say, you should feel better about yourself, okay? But I've noticed as a counselor for years that sometimes telling a person to feel better about themselves doesn't necessarily work very well, okay? What you will find as we work through the next 30 minutes or so together is that to really understand your value, it's not about you, it's about God's love of you. God didn't simply love you because you were valuable. You'll see that in a second. God loving you is what makes you valuable. Okay? So this is an entirely different realm so that when I struggle with my feelings or you struggle with yours or we have those feelings of self-worth or self-pity, we can remember it is about who God is, not about what we feel in the moment. If it was limited to what we feel in the moment, we'd all be in a difficult predicament. Let me just give you a couple of things as we move through that that we can see. Here's the first one. The glory of God is revealed through his character. Okay, this is the other cool part about this morning. You're going to learn some Hebrew this morning. Is everybody excited about that? Okay, That's great. Okay, so you're going to learn some Hebrew, and I bet you're going to find out some things you didn't know in learning some Hebrew. Now, you're not going to become proficient in it because your teacher isn't proficient in it, all right? But I know how to cheat a little. I just told you I know how to cheat a little bit to find the answers, okay? I know how to cheat a little bit to find some of these answers, so we're going to take a look at that in a moment. And here's the first idea. The first idea is this. The glory of God is revealed through his character. You can be certain God will keep his promises. The glory of God is revealed through his character. You can be certain God will keep his promises. Now, if you haven't opened up your Bible, I want you to, okay? Psalm 8 is where I want you to go. And if you got it on your phone, open it up on your phone. You need to see your text, right? Not just take my word for it, but see your text. Most English translations do something with the word Lord and in Psalm 8.1, you see it really, really clearly. You see this idea. Our Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Now, you first, your eye immediately sees that one of the Lords is capitalized and the other one isn't. Okay? And when you're reading through your Bible, you're going to say, I wonder why they capitalized Lord here and they didn't capitalize it here. And the reason for that is it's signifying two different Hebrew words. And so I've kind of captured an inner linear underneath there for you. Listen, the Hebrew is what looks like uh, the, the squigglies that are there. By the way, this really quick thought about the Hebrew language. Not only are you reading it backwards from the back of the book to the front of the book, right? But you're also, you'll also notice in the Hebrew language that there are no vowels, okay? We put the vowels in because the vowels are pointed. So all those little dots and lines underneath, all the big letters are consonants, all the little squigglies underneath them are the vowels, okay? It was not initially written with the vowels, but the translators came along later and said, listen, we want to make sure you got the right word here. You say, well, how could you ever read a language without any vowels? You do this all the time. When you leave this morning and you see certain license plates without a vowel, your mind will fill in the vowels, right? And you'll know that for some reason, those people put peanut butter on their license plate, okay? Even though there's no room for vowels, see? You and I begin to see and see that, and that's what the Hebrews did. But here's what I want you to point out. Whenever you see the word Lord capitalized, it's going to be the Hebrew word Yahweh. Now, what makes that significant is the word Yahweh is God's personal covenant named Israel. Covenant means promise. It is God's personal promise-keeping name for Israel. And by the way, in the Old Testament, the word Yahweh is used about 7,000 times. Are you ready for that? Right. By the way, it's also where in our English Bibles, we get the word Jehovah from. 
Some translations will say it's Jehovah because the Y sounds like a J, Jehovah, Jehovah. Once you put the vowels in, you can see how you get Yahweh to Jehovah. None of that matters. All I need you to see is this, that whenever you see the Lord capitalized, you want to remember God is keeping his promise. God is keeping his promise. And he always uses that term, like I said, nearly 7,000 times as if to affirm when we worship God and see the glory of God, we are drawn to his character, not simply to all the things he's done. Now, the next word there is the word Adon. So you see Yahweh is the capital Lord. The other word for Lord is the word Adon, or you might hear Adonai in that. Here's the idea there. That's a word that means master or ruler. Some have translated this word as this is why God is sovereign. He is the master and the ruler over all. So here's what you got. God is both personal, promise-keeping, and at the same time, he is not only a covenant-keeping God, but he is also the ruler or master. In fact, the Faith Life Study Bible says it this way. The first Hebrew word used here is Yahweh, is God's personal covenant named Israel. The second Hebrew word is Adon, conveys the sense of master. This statement declares that Yahweh is the master or ruler over the psalmist and all of God's people. Okay. That's why we say the glory of God is revealed through his character. You can be certain God will keep his promises. Now go back with me and think about Psalm 8.1 for just a second again. O Lord, Yahweh, our Lord, Adonai, how majestic is your name in all the earth. One writer has said, when you see name, you recognize God's character, nature, and personality is recognized throughout the earth. Okay? That's why it says, how majestic is your name throughout the earth. Here's the second idea. The glory of God is seen through his works. And I just added this little applicational point. Okay? You cannot appreciate God's creation in a hurry. One of the reasons I think that we as Westerners probably aren't great worshipers is because every time we're going somewhere, we're running there. Okay? And because we're running there, we never really pause to say, wow, I just got to get lost here in the creation of what God is doing. We don't look at creation that way. We see it as a nuisance, right? When you and I pull out of here as the summer progresses and all of a sudden vines um, in our New Jersey soil are going up the telephone pole, hanging over the wires, we think, you gotta be kidding me. When we go home in the spring and our yard needs to be cut twice a week, okay, we see it as a burden, not stand in amazement that it actually grew. Right? When the weeds spring up, you say, God didn't send the weeds, Satan did, okay? But God enabled stuff to grow, right? And plus, those of you who our horticulturalists, you know this, that roses are nothing but what? Weeds, that's right, kind of refined a little bit. Okay. Here's the picture. God causes all of that to grow. We see it as a nuisance. I've always remembered that um, when we lived in upstate New York, there was this section of road on Route 9 there that I would have to travel occasionally. And what was really cool about it is you came right alongside this nine-mile lake and the mountains were on both sides. You couldn't see the mountains on your side, but you could see them on the other side of the lake. And um, right before we left, I, I was driving down that section of road, and the mist from the lake was hanging like halfway up the mountain so that I couldn't see the middle of the mountain. I could, I could only see the mist coming off the lake, and I could see the top of the mountain point, poking through the mist. And I remember pulling off and the, the road and saying, have I been driving by this for three years? And I just haven't stopped to look. You and I need to understand, we cannot worship God properly or see him in creation properly when we're in a hurry. We're always racing somewhere. The creation should cause us to look at the creator and be humbled. The creation should cause us to look at the creator and be humbled. You do understand, right, that when we read all of this stuff in Psalm 8, you have set your glory above the heavens. You have established strength because of your foes. Verse three, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place. Look at verse five. 
Uh, yet you have made him, that is man, a little lower than heavenly beings and crowned him with the glory and honor. Verse six, you have given him dominion over the work of your hands. What is the work of your hands? The sheep and the oxen and the beast of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea, all fish. God has created all of that. Let me give you three thoughts. Here we go. Um, God does big things really well. Just say that with me. God does big things really well. Here's the second thought. God does small things really well. Say that one with me. Here's the third thought. God does all things really well, okay? Big things, small things, all things. Let's just talk about the creation of God for just a moment. God does big things really well. Now, I can't even really fathom these numbers, but here they are. There's roughly 10 trillion galaxies in the universe. 10 trillion galaxies in the universe. If we take 100 billion stars, which is what we think we have in our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, and we multiply that, just estimating that the 10 trillion galaxies have kind of our stars, we come up with this number. There are this many stars in the world, right? That's a septinogen or something, septillion or something like that. It's a one with 24 zeros behind it. Here's the thing you really need to know. If you heard on the radio that you could get a star named after you, but you better call in because you're going to miss the opportunity, okay? There is no way in a jillion years you're going to miss the opportunity, okay? God has created so many stars that we can't even count them. We can only kind of guess or estimate them. Fathom that for a second. That's because God does big things really well. Let me give you this option. God does small things really well. Right now, there are 37.2 trillion cells in your body. Some of you are saying, no, I think there's a few more cells in the body next to me than are in my body, okay? Here's what I want to tell you. That's kind of a general estimate again, because depending on how you count them, we can't really count them very well. Somewhere, some have said between um, 15 trillion cells and 70 trillion cells. So I guess the Smithsonian said, listen, we're just going to say it's 37.2. Here's what I want you to know. Those cells are so remarkable in what they do. In fact, a number of years ago, I heard that if we went back about 100 years and we asked scientists to describe the complexity of the human cell, they would say it's kind of like a car, right? It's got different things in there, and, and it's got like an alternator, and it's got like, a, and it's got like a, a radiator, and it's got stuff to cool the engine off. A cell has kind of like a car, right? But the more that science developed and understood what was going on, I remember reading, or hearing, rather, um, that the cell, a human cell, is not like a car. It's more like New York City. Picture that. In fact, I asked a friend of mine who knows a lot more about this because he got his PhD in that stuff, and he smiled and said, Phil, that's exactly right. You can't imagine what the cell can do. There's all kinds of stuff working in every single human cell. Now, next time you drive over the bridge, and you see Philadelphia off in, the, off in the horizon there, I just want you to stop for a moment and look and say, I have one cell that is more complicated than that city, okay? and yet I have 37.2 trillion of those things that God made. You can't do that in a hurry. When you and I are racing over the river to get to our next appointment, and we're listening to something that doesn't even make any difference on the radio, we are not pausing long enough to worship God. You and I must stop and think and look differently. I have a cousin. He married into the family, and I just heard last night that he'd been promoted to, like, to some major string quartet um, out of uh, Indiana University. He is incredibly, incredibly skilled. Okay? In fact, sometimes when I've heard him play, I've just kind of, my jaw just kind of drops. He um, he's a master at what he's done. He, he married into the family, so it's not in my DNA, trust me, okay? Um, but he's played in the Kennedy Center, the Hollywood Bowl. He's played in all of these different locations, nationally and internationally. When I hear Austin play, I'm humbled, right? I think, I didn't even know fingers could move that fast on a violin, right? How does he know? How does he hear? How does he do all of that? I'm humbled. But you know what else I am? I sit there and think, he can do things creatively that I could never do. But I know him, right? That's like really amazing. Like on family retreats, I played basketball with him, hoping I wouldn't break a finger, right? 
or that he had an insurance policy on his fingers. Okay. I, I've had conversations with him sitting alongside the pool, both of us talking about our crafts, mine and speaking, his and music, both of us talking about what we've learned and developed in those. I keep thinking to myself, he is really good at what he does, but I know him. When you and I look at creation, we should stop and say, not only are we awed by what God did, but we should stop and say, just finish it with me, I know him. Can you fathom that for a second? I remember our pastor in California telling the story that he, uh, there was a gentleman in his church who'd come to know Christ, and, and he went to visit him at his home. And he got to the home, and the man said, come here, come here, you got to see this, you got to see this. And he drug him back to his backyard, and he said, you got to look at my rose garden. Isn't this amazing? This is the most amazing thing. And John said to him, why are you so excited? He said, oh, no, 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 no. Before I was a Christian, these were just roses. Okay. But now that I'm a Christian, I know the person who makes these things work. Right. See the difference? If you and I are racing through all that is going on in creation, there is no way we're going to become good worshipers. Now, here's what I want to do. I don't often do this. In fact, I don't think I've ever done this, but I'm going to do it now, okay? You saw a video at the beginning that was pretty cool. I'm going to replay that video, but this time I want you to look with different eyes, okay? You can, if you're an artist, you can look with the eyes of an artist. Look for the colors. Look for the textures. Look for the, the, the movement. Look for, look for all the things that an artist would look for. If you're an engineer, look through the eyes of an engineer, Think about how the monkey's hand was created in such a way that it can grasp and swing from those trees. Think about, as an engineer, how all of those birds fly and don't run into each other when we have to have like a traffic controller to land a half a dozen planes in an airport. Okay? Think about how God created all of those things. And then at the end, you're going to get a chance to say, I know him. Right? Just watch. So here's a question. Did you see it differently the second time? Did you see the video differently the second time? Like before, we just kind of caught up in it, but the second time, did you see it and say with me, one, two, three? That is why you can't rush past God's creation. It was meant to remind us that God not only does big things well, God not only does small things well, but God does all things really well. Here's your third idea. That's pretty cool, but that's not as cool as the last idea, okay? Go back with me to Psalm 8, verse 4. What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Now, remember how I said that your understanding of your value is not tied to how you feel about yourself. It is tied to how this majestic, promise, covenant, keeping God, who is master and ruler of the entire universe, values you. In fact, let's just kind of unpack that. You can find your value in God's concern and grace for you. Notice, you don't find your value in anything that you did but in God's concern and grace for you. And that is why verse four says this, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Now, when I look at that text, I immediately understand my, mind is, my eye is drawn to four different words. What is man that you're mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? You say, well, Phil, man is there twice. That's right. But what you should know from the opening Hebrew lesson is that just because our English Bible says it's man doesn't mean it's the same Hebrew word. Hold on for that. I also notice that God is both mindful and cares. That's great. God is both mindful and cares. What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? So let's just say it this way. Man is, God is, man is, God is. Just say that with me. Man is, God is, man is, God is. One more time. Man is, God is, man is, God is. This is how you and I should understand our value. Whatever your circumstances, whatever your difficulty, however you've looked at yourself, today should be a different day. You should be able to say, man is, God is, man is, God is. Here's the first one. Man, here's the first one. Man is weak. He cannot live forever. You say, well, I didn't see that. I just saw the word man, okay? That's right. Man is weak. He cannot live forever. In fact, Genesis 2 tells us that 
For God said that when they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they would begin to die. Okay? You say, well, that doesn't help me with my self-esteem problem. I'm weak and I'm going to die. Like, that's real encouraging, Phil. Hold on, hold on. Man is weak. Let me give you the way we get that. By looking at two Hebrew words here, remember I said, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? So this is called an interlinear. You're looking at the Hebrew beneath it and then you're looking at what we call an English transliteration. That's what the rest of us read who can't read Hebrew, which is beneath that. And I noticed that the word man in verse four is the word enosh, but down in verse, um, later in verse four, and the son of man, it is the word Adam. Okay, man is the word Adam. You say, wow, I didn't know that. That's right. When God created man and placed him in the garden, he created Adam. That's not all you're going to learn about Adam in a second, but watch this. When I read the word man and Enosh, I understand that the word Enosh actually comes from another word, which actually spoke of being weak and sickly. Okay. You say, well, well, I feel weak at times, and I even feel like I'm not feeling really well at times. I guess that word properly describes me. Here's what I want to remind you of. Um, you and I were created to live forever, but because of sin, we cannot live forever. So just think about this for a second. When you and I are feeling weaker and weaker and we're starting to just, our bodies are starting to shut down and our minds are starting to struggle and, and everything around us seems to be a struggle, we would do well to remember that we are weak and we cannot live forever. But guess what? Our value is not found in who we are. Our value is found in the God who was mindful of us even though we were weak. That's why we say it that way. Let me give you the other one. God is. God is mindful. He remembers man's condition. Man is weak. He cannot live forever. God is mindful. He remembers man's condition. Now, um, when I grew up in uh, rural Indiana, um, I loved hanging out at my grandmother's house. So I would get home off the bus. Their house was in front of ours. Rather than walk the whole way home, I'd just stop in and see her. My grandma always said these little proverbial things, but one of the things she often said is, you, you can finish with me. Uh, here's the sentence. Philip, make, Philip, that's what I got called when I was a child, okay? Philip, make sure that you blank your manners. What did she say? Mind your manners. Okay. Now, what she was saying is this you need to remember that there are certain manners. If you want these chocolate chip cookies, you just can't barge in here and take them, okay? You need to remember your manners. What the Bible says is this, what is man that you are mindful of him? Are you with me? Whatever your circumstance, God remembers, okay? You say, but I'm weak. I'm not really, I don't really feel like I'm worth that much. Here's the thing you gotta know. The Bible agrees, you're weak, but guess what? God remembers, God hasn't forgotten you. It's one of the most beautiful things in the Bible is, is when you read about God remembering a person's condition. Here's what you want to understand. Psalm 8.1, man is, God is, man is, God is. Man is weak. God remembers man's condition. Here's the third idea. Man is. Man is weak. He cannot live forever. God is mindful. He remembers man's condition. Man is an image bearer. He was meant to live, not to die. He said, well, wait a minute. I thought you just told me that we couldn't live forever. That's right. But we were created in the image of God. That means that we were meant to live, not to die. This is a great word, by the way. And it's tied, again, to that second word, man, which is Adam. Remember you saw that? Go back with me to Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, for just a moment. Genesis 2, verse 7. <clears throat> because I want to teach you something else about the Hebrew word Adam, which, of course, is the Hebrew word that means man. Um, look with me at Genesis 2, verse 7. Then the Lord God formed the man of the dust, the man of the dust from the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. Now, because I already taught you the word for man, you look at verse 7, and you say, okay, Phil, that must be the word Adam, and you're exactly right. But here's what I want you to see. Look at the Hebrew again. Then the Lord formed the man of the dust of the ground and breathed into that man the breath of life. Man is the Hebrew word, Adam, okay? But ground is the Hebrew word, Adama. They're the same word with a little bit of a change. This is why when we go to a funeral and someone says, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, it's taking place because they're saying we're returning them to the ground. I don't really like that analogy. Here's why. 
because God breathed into man the breath of life. Okay? That's why he became an image bearer. An image bearer only works if he is alive, right? if he's alive. That's why God breathed into him the breath of life. That's why he says in Genesis 1, let us, speaking to the Trinity, make man in our image. He doesn't do that with the animals. He doesn't do that with any other creature. He does that with man. Man is made in the image of God so that while he is living, he can proclaim the image of God to all who see. The truth of the matter is this. When we are living... We are image bearers of God. Adam, out of the dust of the ground, if we did not have the breath of God in us, we would be nothing but, say it, dirt. Right? There is no value, not a lot unless you live in New Jersey and you're trying to grow asparagus, in dirt. Okay? But there's a lot of value when God breathes into that dirt living life that is, as it were, making that person, that man and that woman, in the image of God. Man is an image bearer. He was meant to live, not to die. I've always remembered that, and I've reminded people ever since, uh, probably for the last eight or nine years, I've reminded people of that when I come to a funeral. Listen, it's painful. That's because you were not created to die. You were created to live. You were not created to be separated in relationship after relationship after relationship, and finally in death be separated fully in relationship. You were created to live and experience relationship. What God does when someone dies is he pours grace into us so that we, by his grace, can sustain through that loss of life. I want to, I want to remind you this. If death is painful to you who have remained, it, it's, not, it's understandable that it would be. You don't have the apparatus to handle it properly because man was created in the image of God as a living creature and sin is what brought death, not God. God said, when you sin, you will die. And they chose to sin and here came the death. It's this great reminder that we, man, is the image bearer. He was meant to live, not to die. Let me give you one more thought. Ready for this? God is compassionate. He cares enough to make a way for man to live. That's right. This is why you and I have value. We have value because God looked at us and loved us. That's why. By the way, he loved the people around you too enough to send his son to die for them too. God loves. God cares. God is compassionate. In Psalm 8, remember the verse again? What is man, Enosh, that you are mindful of him, God remembers? And the son of man, Adam, made from the dirt, that you care for him, God's compassion. Man is weak, God is mindful. Man is an image bearer, God is compassionate. God is compassionate. He cares enough to make a way for man to live. Now, let me give you that same passage with just a little twist. You ready? Because this is how God shows his love. What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels, and you've crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything under subjection of his feet. You say, Phil, that just sounds like Psalm, that just sounds like Psalm 8, but it isn't. Right? It's Hebrews chapter 2. It's the writer of Hebrews going back and looking at Psalm 8 and saying, let me draw an application from this passage, and so I'll insert it into my writing in Hebrews. But he just doesn't talk about man in general. Look what he says. Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside of his control. At present, we do not see everything in subjection to him, but we see him for who he is. A little while was made lower than the angels, say it with me, namely crowned with glory and honor. What the writer of Hebrews says is this, Psalm 8 may apply to all mankind, but it specifically applies to Jesus, who God, when Jesus was born, said, listen, for a time being, you will be in your humility lower than the angels. You say, what does that mean? Hey, I'll just say it. Think about it this way. You ever see it? The, the angels aren't in the manger in the Christmas scene. They're over the manger. They never had to be humbled in the way that Christ was humbled. 
nor did they suffer the way that Christ has suffered. And you have crowned him with glory and honor. I love this. Because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. This is speaking of Jesus. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. When you and I doubt our value, we come back to this idea. Christ died in our place. God loved us so much that he gave his son for us. Some 20 years ago when we were uh, looking for a home, and then God wonderfully orchestrated an opportunity for us to build a home in New Jersey. Uh, when we were looking, people would ask me, so Pastor Phil, what are you looking for, right? Like, like how much can you spend, right? And I said, I don't know. I mean, I don't even know how much I can spend. Um, so what kind of house are you looking for? Or the house that you're looking for, what is it valued at? And I remember that one of our deacons one time said to me when I was trying to tell him what we were looking for and quoting everybody else's numbers, okay? He said, Philip, a property's value is not determined by what everybody says it is. Okay. I said, what do you mean by that? He said, a property's value is determined by what someone is willing to pay for it. Okay. That's all it is. He said, they're estimating at what they think somebody's willing to pay. But listen, I've seen houses go for a lot less because nobody was willing to pay that for it. And I've seen houses go for a lot more because a lot of people were willing to pay that for it. Value in the market is driven by what someone is willing to pay. You got it? Make the connection. Our value is understood because of what God was willing to pay to get us back. You've been working your whole life trying to please people, trying to please God, trying to do all these things, but you've never stopped to say, I'm weak just an image bearer, and I'm sinful, and I struggle, and I keep trying, and you've never paused to say, I believe that Jesus Christ came, and he died on the cross for my sins because I am valuable, because God loved me and was willing to pay the price of his son for me. The glory of God leads us to understanding our value properly.